Okay, well, I think we'll make a start and anyone who's late can join us in a moment. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming this afternoon to uh, the third of our uh, webinars on schools, Passive House in Schools. Uh, my name is Caroline Martin. Um, for those of you who were here last week, you'll have uh, met me already. Um, I work for Warm Low Energy Building Practice and I'm going to be chairing today's session. Uh, so this week we're focusing on uh, new build schools. So last week we did um, retrofit, this week we're looking at new build schools. Um, so before um, I go on to sort of introduce today's uh, speakers, I'll just give you a bit of background from um, my background. So I work for WARM, as I said, and we are Passive House certifiers and designers and consultants and trainers and all things Passive House. And we were one of the first Passive House certifiers in the country and so have been kind of involved in Passive House in the UK right from the beginning. And um, certainly one of the, well, the first job that I certified actually was a school um, back in 2013, the primary school. Um, and even then it wasn't the first, there'd actually been three primary schools that had been certified the year before in 2012. Uh, these were all archetype designed and we'll be hearing from Sean Ed from archetype a bit later on this afternoon. Um, so schools are certainly, yeah, not, not uh, they were one of the um, sort of first non-residential um, buildings that got certified in, uh, to be um, certified in this country. And since, so I think probably had at least one school going through our books in one form or another, um, sort of consistently throughout the last, uh, I don't know, eight years or so. Um, and we've probably certified, I think, around 10 school related buildings. And then also we've also in that time worked really closely with the Passive House Institute in Germany to develop the standard for schools and ensure that the certification process is relevant and reflects the way we use schools in the UK. So it's been a very interesting process. And um, we're lucky to hear from two speakers today who will be telling us about their experience of Passive House and New Build Schools. Before I introduce them, though, I'll just do a quick bit of housekeeping um, for today. So at the bottom of your screen, probably, um, you'll find your Zoom controls. And there's a Q&A chat. There's a Q&A and a chat window. So there's two different windows. If you could have any questions throughout at any point during the talks, then put that in the Q&A. If you just um, have a sort of technical question or want to say hi to people, then use the chat. Um, so basically any questions that go into that Q&A, we'll try and either answer live in our questions bit or we'll take it to the panel at the end or we'll try and um, answer it in, in, the type, in the type box. Um, so, um, we're going to have questions, live questions after each of the two presentations, and then we'll have a panel session right at the end for 10 minutes or so. So lots of time for answering questions. So yeah, any questions, pop them in the Q&A. In a moment, we're going to ask you a, quest you a question uh, using the poll feature. So that will pop up on your screen any minute now, um, and you just select the answer you want, and, uh, and you'll all be able to see the answers. Um, so that should come up any minute, all goes to plan. Um, just to let you all know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available after, um, after the event to all attendees, but it'll be, it won't be instantly available. It'll be a few days time, we'll be um, made aware of when that's available. Uh, um, and last but not least, uh, thank you to our sponsors, Robertson, um, Hub East, I didn't almost forgot the name then, Hub East Central and Archetype. That's not very good, is it? Um, so let's uh, move on here. So as I said, this uh, webinar is the third of six webinars and um, all related to schools. And it's following on from the popularity of the Passive House Trust's educational buildings campaign last autumn. So we're in... Um, phase two here uh, where we're, we've got all these procurement webinar series and at the end I'll go through um, the other ones that are remaining and we've also got a workshop that um, should be really good that you need to sign up to but I'll give you the information again about that at the end. Okay 
So, oh, um, click the right button here. So, moving swiftly on, who have we got to speaking today? Uh, we have got, uh, we'll be hearing today from Andrew Thompson and Sean Ed Holland, and they're going to talk to us about their experiences of delivering passive houses in schools. Um, so, uh, we're going to start with Andrew. Andrew is the design manager for the capital programme team at the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, Andrew is a chartered engineer with experience working in both the private and public sectors, and he currently leads the council's in-house multidisciplinary design team. Um, he's overseeing the design function of this team, as well as the design of projects delivered for the authority by external consultants. And uh, Andrew really enjoys being at the forefront of low carbon sustainable design, delivering projects that challenge and reshape the way buildings and developments interact with the environment and their communities. And then secondly, we have Sean Ed, and Sean Ed um, works for Archetype. Um, Sean Ed joined Archetype in early 2016, and in which time she has qualified as both an architect and as a passive house designer, um, supporting many of Archetype's most exciting passive house projects, of which there are many. She has um, a lot of experience on working on passive house schools, um, she's seen the Harris Academy in Sutton through from feasibility to construction, and that will be, um, I'm told, the first secondary school to be certified when it gets certified. Um, and she's taking on, um, and she, for that, she was the had the principal role of the Passive House Designer. Um, she's also worked on Hackbridge Passive House Plus, Pri Passive House Plus Primary School, so that's even more, even that's like the best you can get to Passive House. Um, and then the Edinburgh Passive House Schools, which we'll be hearing about from uh, Andrew. And most recently, she's been leading the design of a new Passive House Primary School in Wolverhampton with net zero buildings. So many, many schools, as you can see. So hopefully you've got lots of questions for these guys um, when we have our panel discussion at the end. So I'm going to now hand over to Andrew and uh, we will hear what he has to say. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, please excuse me for a minute while I wrestle with technology. Yes, I hope everybody can see that. Yeah, that um, is perfect. Excellent. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the design manager at the City of Edinburgh Council's Capital Programmes team. And the capital programs team responsible for the delivery of education projects within the estate. This includes new build projects as well as major refurbishments. Currently, I had a check on this. We have circa 500 million pounds worth of work either in design and construction or uh, in the pipeline. So there's a significant body of uh, educational work uh, being delivered by the council at the moment. Uh, so picking up on the actual uh, subject here, this presentation will focus on briefing for a pathway school from a client's point of view and a technical point of view. It, it will set out how, uh, the technical requirements of our school projects and how this adapts to the, to the dynamic policy environment that we currently operate in. I'll cover why, how and what is briefed. How does passive house relate to other relevant standards and guidance and try and make sense of any kind of potential conflicts that come up. I'll look at how we make decisions along the way without compromising on the product we get at the end of the job. And uh, we'll look at certification, yes, no, maybe. And finally, um, we'll have a discussion on procurement. I could probably talk for about 20 minutes on procurement, but um, I, I, I'd rather not. So why provide a technical brief? It is easy to get carried away by the commission of a new school and deliver it on the usual traditional benchmarks, say on GIFA, course parameters, education parameters. But once the new shininess of a facility wears off, then there is always, or often, a little bit of a disappointment. It's easy to blame project teams or procurement processes or contractors 
But as a client, we need to take responsibility and clearly, unambiguously set out our needs. So covered in a previous presentation by one of my colleagues uh, was why Passive House, why City of Edinburgh has gone down the road of Passive House. But I thought it was worthwhile just to kind of pick up on this. We have the usual top complaints for education buildings. Uh, number one is overheating. Uh, that is by far the biggest. Then we have number two, acoustic issues. And number three, robustness and suitable of materials, specified materials. That combined with the challenging kind of target set by policymakers on both energy and in carbon, as well as wider issues that were required to address under construction quality, then passive house is a nice fit. It fits around and helps to deliver in all these issues, as well as, if used right, helping come up with a nice, simple solution that is user-friendly. So, identifying the need for a project or a building is a complicated process and it takes time. It is important to recognise the various drivers establishing the project or building need and at the length that this process takes. So briefing can't start properly until the need has been fully established in order to reflect the policy agenda at the time. So despite the fact that we are looking at building a new school 10 years ago, the technical brief will not be developed until that project is formally commissioned. The life of the design and construction element of the project is small in terms of the rest of the life of the asset. This presentation will focus on the technical brief, which is outlined in the dotted grey box. But it's important to recognise that simultaneous exercises picking up educational needs, such as area schedules, departmental adjacencies, pedagogy issues, and the requirement for flexible learning spaces are all elements of the education brief. The technical brief needs to consider this and provide minimum technical references to the required educational spaces. So how do we do that? Continued technical oversight of the process from start to finish. So what is a brief? At project commissioning and in parallel with procuring the design service, CEC will produce an outline technical brief. This will largely be based on previous projects and is referred to by CEC and largely in Scotland as the ACR or the Authority Construction Requirements. It's a, a mouthy title, I'd rather it was called something else, but hey ho. On completion, this will be issued to the commissioned project team. As we develop the project through the design life, the brief will develop and align specifically to that project's needs. Fixed roundabout neighbour stage two, this will become the technical brief that performance is measured against. Any deviation from this point will be recorded on a schedule as a formal derogation and will need to be agreed with the authority. The iterative process is referred to as the engagement process and a similar exercise is carried out with the education brief, albeit with different and wider stakeholders such as existing school, parent councils, etc. Right. Okay. Multiple as aspects help inform this brief, and each of these aspects can change from project to project or as time moves on. Council and government policy is moving fast in respect to construction and indeed to carbon emissions and energy. And lessons learned from previous projects are also important to capture. For a high school list document is typically 100 to 150 pages long. As previously mentioned, this document covers a wide range of aspects associated with the project from the design process and deliverables to the construction setup and methodology and the operational needs and required outputs. Summarised here, the key requirements for a building reflecting current policy. 
So for this particular project, certified passive house classic is required. In accordance with council policy, fossil fuel is not used as a heating source. And in most of our schools and properties now in the design board, uh, air source heat pump or some sort of heat pump will be used as a heating source. A quality interior environment is required, and this is benchmarked against BB101 and the Education Funding Agency's daylight metrics. Acoustic criteria are set, and these are generally aligned to BB93. PV and renewals are not a must for our buildings currently, but they must be future-proofed for easy PV fitting post-contract. The standard also sets out the digital information requirements and aligns that generally to government standards, as well as the detailed stage delivery requirements, including energy, thermal, daylight, energy use, and PHPP modeling. This allows informed decision-making to take place. So the brief is developed in conjunction with other standards, as well as passive house, and, is, and, and passive house is indeed used as a means to an end. There is a requirement for a brief to address other policy needs, as well as different technical standards and guidance, all of which are areas of potential conflict and contradiction. So here on the left, I've outlined some wider policy issues, the Scottish Government's 2040 and 2045 carbon targets, the, the City of Edinburgh's 2013 and 2037 carbon targets, the Scottish Future Trust Minimum Energy Standards, as well as recently issued net zero public building standards and the City of Edinburgh White City Plan, which is in flow through planning. The brief also picks up, as I touched on earlier, on other guidance, and other guidance be, could be the Education Funding Agency's daylight guidance or any of the BBs and subsidy guides. All of these provide potential or actual conflicts that need to be managed. In practice, we find that Passive House helps deliver against the policy targets. By providing quantifiable reductions in energy and associated carbon emissions, it helps meet the Council's and government's operational carbon targets. In fact, the recent net zero public building standards were, were benchmarked against a couple of our projects, Pathfinder projects, and both of these projects performed extremely well, despite not knowing any of these uh, criteria at the, at the, uh, the, the design stage. But where conflict does exist is in the design guidance. In practice, BB101 and Passive House Comfort strategies generally align, and it is in achieving good daylighting as well as the comfort standards that the biggest challenges are. For CAC projects, achieving Passive House is a must, and decisions make, making needs to recognize this. Actually not compromising is extremely difficult, but making informed compromises, understanding the balances between various standards, recording and noting the impact of every compromise is important. This is best achieved by constantly reviewing and updating the status of the project and the impact of the decisions made. Modeling using different tools to assess against various criteria. An example on the slide that I show, we, there are uh, comfort criteria in the table and daylight criteria on the uh, on the graphic below. Uh, we're meeting the daylight criteria criteria here, but just missing out in the comfort criteria. These are the, these. This sort of model, modeling is essential to make that informed compromise, informed decision making. If we're using different modeling tools, it is really important to ensure that the inputs are aligned across these different models. It's quite often the systems will have different defaults. Picking up on this, this further, informed decision making on, is really important. On CEC projects, we understand that sensitivity analysis, and here we're playing with windows configurations, shading configurations, and room depths in which to optimize various standards. This is looking at comfort, daylight, and passive house. 
not necessarily all focused on Paso House, but focused on delivering the best school or interior environment we can provide and achieving passive house. So certification. At each stage, there's a tendency or has been a tendency to carry out value engineering and compromises that are not often informed, meaning that the best intentions aren't always delivered. Initial requirements can be diluted following delivery and sometimes considerably. This can result in increased energy use or weakened comfort performance. Certifying involves a certifier through the construction process, looking at certain details, an extra pair of eyes helps drive up construction quality, particular to the external envelope. So does the City of Edinburgh Council require certification? It does. So, procurement. What is the best procurement route for passive house? If multiple options are available. You know, I welcome anybody to answer that question, which is the best one. Everybody has good and bad experiences of procurement. There's a pros and cons to each. After consideration, the council are trialing two-stage design and build on its first tranche passive house schools. Is this the right approach? What is the right approach? You know, we'll no doubt learn from the process. And if anybody has any experiences that they would like to share on procurement and passive housing, I'll happily listen. So our approach. A design team is procured from the framework. Currently, it's our in-house professional services framework, which is now under up and running. Starting at either Reba stage zero or one, depending on the project status. A contractor is procured around about Reba stage three and a pre-construction agreement from a suitable national framework to provide design and cost advice. At Reba stage four, the project is fully costed and the contractor operates on a design and build basis with the team largely innovated. A retained service, either by the project architect and M&A engineer or a separate independent body is commissioned to monitor the final stages of the project from a construction quality and client point of view. The passive house certifier remains client side as does the project manager and quantities of air. Our most advanced project using this methodology is currently at Reba stage four. So the contractor is around the table and in providing design advice and cost advice, however, hasn't yet entered into the construction stage. Like everything associated with this brief, the procurement methodology is under constant review and we will feed back into what we do based on the success of these current trailing projects. So just in summary, a good brief needs to set out what success looks like for a project allow for a detailed, informed compromise and decision-making processes at all stage, ensure passive house is not compromised, although you can play about with the nuance of the PHPP and to balance potential conflicting needs of other standards, and allow for feedback loops from pre previous projects and learn from both mistakes and things that went well. And it needs to reflect the dynamic policy environment that public sector buildings are currently operating in. And an example I'd give for that would be under the next iteration of our brief, our technical brief, ACRs. This will recognise embodied carbon and circular economy in accordance with the current Scottish Government guidelines. Thank you for listening, and I'll happily take questions now. Great, thank you, Andrew. That was really interesting and um, very detailed. And, um, and I'm waiting for people to start digesting that and ask some questions now. So everybody out there, if you've got any questions, do um, put them to Andrew now, but we do have a panel session at the end if you can't, can't think of anything now or it comes to you later on. Um, we do have one, uh, well, one question and one comment, I guess, at the moment though. Um, so one is, what was the basis of the daylighting metrics? What um, ADF are you achieving? 
that's average daylighting factor, is yeah. that right? The last, the last DFA guidance got updated in May last year, uh, and um, we it looks at UDI rather than a, a daylight factor. So, um, but we use the latest guidance, which is the May 2020 EFA daylight guidance. Um, I've got a question as well as that sort of follows on from that. Was was there? Did you find that any of the other standards you mentioned um, were any sort of harder to um, harder sort of make work than others? So, did you find that that some of them were sort of a better fit or but, not for passive house? There, or? there are a. I think the, the biggest challenge, as I touched on there, the biggest challenge is definitely between daylight and comfort. So uh, the overheating and achieving the daylight uh, and trying to maximize the daylight and completely eliminate any of the overheating risk. Uh, we get lots of complaints on overheating, but only little amount of complaints or not enough daylight. So you, you kind of balance that up. Yes, we want to hit the daylight metric, but we don't want to compromise comfort. Yeah. And I guess it's, yeah, which is the biggest risk? Which one can you overcome in other ways? I'm just going to mute my phone. Um, there's another comment um, you're asking about that, uh, if anyone wanted to share how they've been in their contracts. And that we've got um, East Ayrshire um, saying they're using the NEC4 contract on a contract on a two-stage basis but on a traditional basis to retain full control of the design does that make sense yes <laughs> I, 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 I would be late to know how that goes so we can, can maybe compare stories yeah well maybe that's something um the workshop that we'll talk about later that's coming up is um might be a good place for that kind of discussion actually um, we have we have a, a two or three traditional schools that aren't past house that are just about finished, and there was that there were some issues with that. So, uh, as I said, everybody has their pros and cons of each. Yeah, I think that yeah, there's not a perfect solution, is there? But yeah, um, great presentation. Are you able to share the brief example? Uh, uh, I, somebody's asked me that in the past. I'll have to check. There's okay. A, there's a, the. I mean, as, as I said in the presentation, the, the brief is an iterative process, so it's it, it predates the requirement for passive house. So you know, it it has taken a lot of input and time into it to develop to where it currently is. But yeah. not, local authorities should be sharing that sort of knowledge. Um, OK, we've got some more questions coming in now. Um, what aspects of the design have you had to spend more time on as a result of targeting Passive House? Than normal, I guess. If you, no, if you it's quite normal. difficult because you do have to spend time on things, even if you weren't doing Passive House. So. What does passive house mean that you've had to spend more time on? Mm, um, I don't know if, if there's an answer to that. I think passive house means that by, by having certified passive house, you kind of hope that it then delivers against things that you're worried about. So actually it takes a little bit of stress off some aspects. So yes, there's a comfort criteria within passive house that you know that, that you know addresses the issues of the complaints we talked about. Okay, it doesn't necessarily do it in the to the end details that maybe BB101 does. So, so we still have that analysis. I don't know if there's anything additional that we would we would have in that's yeah it's an interesting answer isn't it response isn't it yeah how do you how do you tease apart what is passive house and what is just Good design, I guess. It's always the, the element. Um, and uh, we've got one here. How do the costs compare with previous schools? The problem, the problem with costs is that it's they're extremely volatile, right? So, uh, and passive house isn't the only change. So. The, it's difficult to then pull out 
how much is passive house costing. So, for instance, we have the recommendations of the core report on construction quality, which are integrated into our, you know, that, that same passive, the new passive house schools. So, how do you separate that from construction quality? And then there's different education requirements, and there's BB 101 2018 that weren't previously delivered. So, you know, it, it, are the schools we're building now more expensive than the ones we built before? Y yes. I think you know the funding mechanism recognises that. How do you quantify how much of that is passive house? Mm, Don't no. know. Yeah. Tell you when it comes back from tender. <laughs> yes. Um. And and last question here before we go on to Sean Ed's presentation is: um, Are there specific passive house qualifications um, yeah. slash experience that you would look for from the design team and contractor? I guess now that you've got a bit of experience Definitely. yourself with it. Certainly, uh, in procuring the design team, Passive House was a part of the quality requirement. So uh, we set out to procure the design team and Passive House experience was a requirement uh, as part of that procurement exercise. And selecting the contractor, I think the contractor, the supply chain is a our Passive House training themselves up like mad at the moment. So, you know, and the contractors that for the one that we've got a contractor on the table, they were had very slick presentations on passive housing. But let's be honest, it's, they've got there in under a year. It's quite difficult to see. It's the same contractors that built the schools that we were a little bit disappointed in that are now seeing their experts in passive house. But there you go. I you know we've been experts in briefing passive house two years ago or either. So maybe and did did you make it a prerequisite that they had to do any kind of training or did you just um sort of look at the ones who maybe had done training ah uh, can you remember i think what have written the pre-qualification questionnaire i'm not 100 sure i think there was a prerequisite to, to to have training on it yeah yeah okay that's great thank you we'll save any more questions that come in um for our panel uh, session at the end, but thank you, Andrew. Um, we'll go on now to um, Seanad's presentation. Hi. Thanks, Seanad. Hi. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> thank Welcome. you. That was such a clear, like, breakdown of how, yeah, of how CEC has like embedded it and first first in such a, a good way into the ACRs. And I'm going to ask Laura to share my slides because I had an issue. <laughs> thank you. Right. Brilliant. So yeah, I'm Sean Ed, <laughs> um, and the second part of the webinar, I'm going to kind of structure it based on five key recommendations for successfully incorporating Passive House into new build school briefs. So we've already done retrofit last week, and um, so this is more focusing on new build school briefs. Um, and I'm actually going to be using Harris Academy Sutton as a case study to illustrate the kind of early stage decisions um, that will really help make a kind of success of the passive house workflow. So next slide. But before we delve in, I'm just gonna give a little bit of background on Archetype. So we're an architectural practice and for the last 35 years or so have been pushing improvements to the quality of sustainable architecture. The way that we've typically tackled that has been very holistic, but one area that we have become particularly specialized in is building performance. So on the next slide, you can see we've recently launched the Perform Consultancy side of the practice, which has enabled us to share our knowledge. And so helping lots of organizations of universities and local authorities to assess performance in operational embodied and life cycle, life cycle carbon. So we're actually now split across three offices. We're a team of, on the next slide, you can see um, we're actually now a team of 68 employees so that includes 20 passive house designers. And, and yeah, we're split across the three main studios covering all of the UK. And so we do specialize in passive house. And on the next slide, you can see just a few of Archetype's passive house projects. And more than anything, really, I think it shows like the real diversity in scale and in sectors that the standard itself, nothing to do with us, but the standard itself is now spread across into the UK. And so here from our first generation passive house schools on the left, 
We've gradually developed the lessons learnt through POE and applied those lessons onto kind of larger schools, onto tighter budgets, and then into new sectors as well. So we've got multi-residential, university buildings, offices, and archives as well. And, but what we're focusing on today is the left-hand side. On the next slide, we're zooming in on the actual new build school projects. Um, so before we go into detail on the how to develop the effective project briefs um, for pacifier schools, it's also worth recapping on why building schools to the pacifier standard um, is so important and why it's so beneficial to the clients and also to the students. And Andrew's already kind of covered a lot of those benefits at the beginning. Um, so I'll just summarize it with these three points on the next slide. It all basically comes down to the fact that Passive House has got a proven standard, it's a proven kind of performance standard that guarantees quality, comfort and reduced energy. So everyone hopefully is kind of getting familiar with those three things. It's not just about energy, um, but in terms of how those three metrics relate to the context of schools specifically, I guess it means that you've got the clients, when, whether that's local authorities or independent schools or trusts, it means that they're going to get the building quality and the long term durability that's needed to meet increasingly more st stringent budgets. And um, it also means in terms of comfort, it means that the teachers themselves are going to have more effective learning environments. So better air quality and, and better acoustics specifically, that's a really good one for schools. And then thirdly, in terms of the reduced energy bills. So there'll be a significant reduction in the LNG bills from the reduced heating demand. And um, which basically most importantly means that there'll be more money available to invest in an engaging curriculum for the pupils. So its appeal and its certainty is the reason so many local authorities and clients are beginning to lock the pacifier standard into their frameworks and their project briefs. And on the next slide, you can see um, the metrics that are starting to emerge now by key procuring organizations across the UK. And um, Andrew's already spoken about why CEC in Scotland have embedded Passive House into their ACRs, into their employers' requirements. And um, their targets have stemmed from this target, the Scottish Trust, St Scottish Tr Futures Trusts target, and um, where it's interesting that the funding incentive is kind of linked to, or the, the performance is actually linked to the funding. So that's how it's done in Scotland. In England and Wales, the policies in my mind seem a little bit more fragmented. Um, but many local authorities in England and Wales now are including the Pass House standard in their planning policies or in their funding arrangements. Um, and the reason there being is because it's a really clear, measurable way of working towards their net zero trajectories. So the DFE as well, we're flagging up that they are now obviously looking at implementing Passive House as well. And um, in some of their pilot, their, we've got 10 pilot zero carbon projects, so they're exploring Passive House for some of those. So yeah, it is increasingly becoming looked at as a clear measurable way of responding to the climate emergency. Um, so that brings me on to the next slide and the first of the five key recommendations for successfully incorporating Passive House into the school brief. And that is to definitely make Passive House certification a requirement from the outset. So focusing on certification there and avoiding any half-hearted ambiguous, ambiguous energy targets. I think it's... Um, really positive and really effective if you go for full certification. So the next slide, thanks. The defining certification itself as a requirement of the brief, this ensures that clients get what they pay for. The danger we found of not including certification um, is that the, the rigor the, of Passive House, and that is in my mind, the most beneficial aspects of the standard, and um, the rigor really starts to get diluted. And without the clear measurable energy targets, it gets really difficult to draw the line on what's acceptable and what's not. And so I've got a good example here with Sutton. Um, we're going to look at Harris Academy Sutton on the next slide. Um, so here, the key reason that the London Borough of Sutton, the client here, opted for Passive House, um, and that was back in 2016, 2015-16, they started looking at it. And the key reason they went for that was because it aligned so well with their one planet living policy. So the local authority, they've always held really high sustainable aspirations. However, for this project in particular, it was even more important because the school was gonna be the first component of a much wider master plan, which is the London Cancer Hub up here on the, on the top of the screen. So Archetype proposed Passive House to the client um, as a way of setting the bar really high for the rest of that master plan development to make sure that they all kind of 
start instilling a, a, I don't know, an ethos of healthy and truly sustainable design. So on the next slide, we start looking at like the fact that that was actually quite a challenging thing. It's not an easy um, aspiration to hold, but yeah, the site here, it was quite contentious and quite constrained by its side, uh, by its size and also by its adjacencies. The massing and design was developed to try and address the, these concerns and the agendas of each single stakeholder involved. And um, so we're trying to do that whilst balancing these with the plethora of standard school design requirements, those ones that Andrew has already spoken about, um, but also passive house requirements as well. So we actually ended up with a less compact form and a, a lot more east and west facing glazing than what we'd normally ideally have in our passive houses. But we were able to use the PHPP, the, the planning, passive house planning package, as a design tool from stage two onwards to test and to optimize the massing and facade design. So we can make sure that we were able to make the massing work within the parameters of passive house. And because the whole design team, everyone knew that certification was locked in, it was a requirement of the brief, the process of refining that massing um, and the design was clear. And that was basically because we all had those measurable targets to aim for. So definitely worth locking in. The recommendation number two is getting the right team on board. So the key thing to note here is that experience of Passive House is definitely useful. However, commitment and genuine interest in building performance is actually more critical in a way. So on the next slide, um, we were looking here on Sutton again at the early design stages initially. So at that stage, it's the Passive House designers and the MEP designers who are most critical in pushing Passive House aspects of the project forward. And that's really what you need to have ideally is a team who are willing to interrogate um, really their standard default design to their default design kind of ethos and what they normally might do. And um, just to make sure that the strategies that are chosen are really efficient as possible. Um, for example, with the, the BB 101 requirement with ventilation, you wanna make sure that you are ensuring a ventilation system, which is not cautiously oversized um, because that will lead to the unnecessary heat loss. So you kind of have to balance these things and kind of push your design team out of their comfort zone perhaps, but making sure that Eero is complying with the, the standard requirements as well. So on Sutton, to give an example, we did actually work with MEP engineers who we'd collaborated with before on another Pacifies project. And that was great because you could kind of apply the lessons learnt. Um, but it is useful to know as well that on other past past projects, we've worked with MEP engineers who haven't, who weren't so familiar with the passive house um, standard. And that's been working quite well, or what has been working quite well on some of our recent projects is that there's been um, a collaborative joint venture MEP team where a practice or a firm with passive house experience has provided oversight and advice to a practice without the experience yet on initial passive house strategies and on the kind of strategic decisions. So that's been working quite well. The next slide is talking about, so getting the right team becomes even more critical when it comes to the tender stage. And as Andrea has already pointed out, procuring and delivering Passive House can happen in very many different ways. Um, but again, it really comes down to the collaboration and attitude of all the parties involved. So some of the suggestions, it, and Andrew, you kind of touched on them as well, like how do you actually assess genuine commitment from a contractor team. It can be quite tricky, but a few suggestions here is to ask detailed ITT questions that focus on quality. So, you know, how do they intend on evidencing um, the quality of work on site and how often? It's also crucial to get the right people reviewing the brief and um, requirements and answering these questions at an interview. For example, those members who will actually be involved in the day-to-day -day running and checking of the site work. It's important that it's not just the, um, the BD team who read the brief and then it doesn't really get passed on to the right people. Um, and it's also really important to include questions which ask for scenario specific responses. So for example, what would you do if the first, um, the initial air test fails or you know, if lead-in times for particular um, products are no longer available? Like it's good to lock those things into the, into the questions and into the brief as well. So the next slide, please. And um, it's also important to include your expectations in the brief on how the lead contractor will be training and managing the wider team to make sure that passive house evidencing and quality assurance is understood across the whole site and not just by a couple of individuals. 
So back to Harris Academy here, these photos um, are from the initial kickoff workshop that Wilmot Dixon arranged for the site and also for all of the subcontractor teams during stage four. And um, at this session, we went through key principles of the design and also of Passive House so that everyone understood why we needed such stringent QA checks and why that was all necessary as part of that initial brief. And um, so we had interactive sessions as well, then with mock-ups, key details so that everyone could get familiar with the products and the sequencing required on site. So Wilmot Dixon, they arranged for lots of members of their team to partake in the Passive House Institutes and WARM's Certified Tradespersons course, and that proved to be really useful. Um, Josh, in one of those photos there, he took on the role after that training as Passive House Champion to help ensure quality of workmanship on the site. So all these things, they kind of seem like they might be a fair way off from those initial discussions that you're having about the brief. Um, but I, yeah, it's really important unless it's actually, unless the client's expectations are written clearly in the brief from the outset, it gets more and more difficult to introduce them at a later stage. Um, okay, number three for successfully incorporating Passive House into a school brief. Um, here, Harris Academy was actually procured through design and build contract. Um, between London Borough of Sutton and Wilmot Dixon. So, yeah, the fact that there was such a committed um, and transparent as well working relationship between Wilmot Dixon, the design team, the client, and also the certifier, um, it meant that the project progressed very collaboratively, more kind of akin to partnering procurement route. For example, when something came up on site that was likely to affect the air tightness or the fabric performance, Wilmot Dixon were very proactive in addressing the issue and making us aware of it, getting us on site and together kind of coming up with a solution. On the next slide, um, Wilmot Dixon, here's a picture of them. They did a really good job of promoting a positive, no blame culture on, on the site there at Harris Academy. They took pride in the fact that this was a passive house construction site and you can see there with the viewing platform and um, that they really you had a sense that they were really invested in making this a success and you know this was done through design and build and um, which worked really well on this on this site and i'm not saying that design and build is the answer at all and um, it's worked well on this but it hasn't worked so well on some of the other passive house projects so it basically all comes down to the the importance of encouraging this effective transparent collaboration and um, number four on the next slide we've got and um, yeah is to set out really clear deliverables and milestones in the briefing and tender documentation so i've put together on the next slide a diagram which illustrates the passive house project uh, process and the milestones against the reba work stages and I think it's super important to have a clear set of milestones in the briefing pack, not only to initially communicate clear expectations, but also to have something that the team can come back to and to measure progress against it as the project progresses. So there's quite a lot that we could discuss in this diagram, but I just want to highlight a few of the particular um, points when it comes to defining milestones in the brief. So, Firstly, the early involvement, maybe on the next slide, the early involvement of the contractor and their supply chain. So as early as stage three, um, you want to get their in, them involved to get them familiar with the passive house detailing so that the team can collaboratively kind of build on and um, to work through buildability and sequencing. The second item on the next slide um, is just showing Wilmot Dixon again on Harris Academy. Um, they worked with us from stage four onwards to develop and design and, and sequencing, like to plan their sequencing of the program. And that was to give a practical oh, and to give a practical example here. Um, we've got the early stage air test that was programmed in before the external fabric was actually completed. So this gave the site team measurable reassurance that the air tightness strategy that they were working so hard for was actually working well. And um, so yeah, it gave that kind of boost of confidence confidence that the effort was definitely worth it along the way. And um, the next slide then is just highlighting one of the other key important things is the staggered evidencing that is required throughout the construction stage. And so it's not being left right until the end when things have been covered up. Wilmot Dixon were great. They used their existing QA system for checking work. So um, it was delivered through or that they developed it through their tablet based app Fearview. Um, to keep a record of photographs and evidencing for warm to, to be able to certify it with ease. 
Um, and then on the next slide is just one last little critical point that is definitely worth thinking about in the briefing milestones. And that's to ensure that there is enough overlap between the MEP engineers at stages three and four, and also the MEP subcontractors. Um, and then eventually also the commissioning engineers because one of the major challenges that we've experienced on projects nearing completion is that there's not been enough continuity between these different parties. Um, and that's to ensure that services are actually commissioned to align with the PHPP and also to align with the design information. Um, and it's for this reason that it's so critical to allow adequate time in the programme and in the brief for commissioning itself. So the summary there is just to ensure that the brief encourages an integrated design approach enabling a good feedback loop to ensure that decisions are communicated to those who are commissioning and eventually those who are using the building. Okay, so that brings me on quite nicely to the, the final point five, and that is to, yeah, <laughs> to basically lock in a building aftercare framework. And um, because the process, it doesn't stop at practical completion from stage seven, when the building is actually being used, and that's the most critical stage for building performance. So a framework is needed to lock in post-occupancy evaluation um, or something similar to kind of soft landings, make sure that it is in the brief from the outset. And this will enable the client to check that the building is being operated as designed, but also that it's operating efficiently. Um, and that's just not at handover, but also as the life of the school um, evolves throughout the seasons, throughout the academic year. And you can see here on the next slide that um, the initial monitoring that we've got at Harris Academy and um, that the building so far is performing as predicted. The graph shows that the energy use intensity or the final energy against SIBSI's benchmark data and the REBA 2030 benchmark and also Letty's benchmark for final energy. And um, so the building is currently only half occupied and um, so this isn't the full story at all. So we're obviously expecting the demand to increase. Our estimate from the PHPP suggests that once it's fully occupied, the energy use intensity, intensity will be closer to 56 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. So just under the LETI target there of 65 for schools. And um, this gradual increase in occupancy is quite common in new build schools. And so you've got to make sure, so ensuring that a contractual framework is there for building in um, the aftercare. And that's to make sure that you can keep kind of tweaking the building to align with these fluctuating capacities, um, because that's crucial. So it was a similar story on UEA, just briefly here on the next slide. Um, the Archetypes Enterprise Centre at UEA, you can see here from the monitor data that the gradual increase in energy consumption, consumption as the building started to get used more, and in fact here a lot more than predicted, um, because the building it was perceived to be such a popular working environment, which is you know a great thing. You can see on the next slide as well um, that we've still got, despite the, the substantial increase in occupancy, it's still meeting an A rating in the deck. So four years on now, not just three, um, but this influx will naturally mean adjustments are needed to the MEP system. So it's important that, the, that there is a structure in place there to keep monitoring and checking that the building is operating efficiently. Um, okay, the last slide then is just highlighting, of course, with POE, a building aftercare framework. It does provide more wider benefits and it provides an opportunity to learn more about the strengths and the weaknesses of a building and its occupants. Um, which is the best way for everyone here, for us, the client team, and all of the design team and the contractors as, as well to give them an opportunity to reflect on the lessons learned. They can be applied then to future projects or future briefs. Um, and it was, this is a little screen grab here of the a session that I did with some of the pupils at Harris Academy to find out how the pupils themselves are finding their new building a few months after they moved in. And it was a really, a really good opportunity to hear their thoughts on the new school and also how engaged they were in the climate emergency. And I feel like more than any other building typology, it is so important that school buildings and, um, you know, where these pupils or the future generations are actually being educated. It's super important that those and um, these buildings are set in a good precedent for energy efficiency and genuine sustainable design. So. Yeah, those are the kind of five hit list recommendations, I think, for embodying embedding passive house into new school builds 
uh, into new build schools. On the next slide, we're kind of just summarizing those five points again. So yeah, it's without a doubt that it is worth putting in the extra effort now at the early briefing stage to lock in certification, to lock in those mechanisms for getting the right team, the right milestones within the brief, and also to define a framework for the building aftercare. Because the end result guarantees that the clients and the students will get a quality teaching environment. So we're going to move on to questions now, I think. Um, Caroline, if you're right to like filter them yep, through. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if people want to ask, like we haven't gone into loads of depth on Harris Academy. Um, but yeah, just to use it as an example, really, for those five points. So happy to take any yeah, questions. <laughs> Perfect. It's that, thank you for that. It's fascinating um, talk. And I think it's really um, nice to sort of hear the whole process from start to actually completed and having people in the schools. And like you say, if anyone is in any doubt about whether to do a passive house school, go and visit one because really they're all amazing, aren't they? They're just like just great places to be. Um, and they do exist. So, you know, they are there. I'm sure you can get you know try and find see if there's one local to you and go and visit it um I loved yeah that there was a lot you were saying quite a lot about sort of the certainty uh, that Passive House brings to a project and I think particularly with schools again that's so important because you are actually going you know you are the client who's building this school but you're actually going to be using this school for years to come so you get all of that benefit from knowing that what is going to be built um, of what has been designed and what you're hoping is going to be built is actually built and I think Andrew touched on that as well as a client you know getting that certainty that you're getting what you want. Um, I also loved all the nice pictures of plant rooms being a building services engineer that made me very happy. It's but so, so I satisfying think that did, about them, <laughs> so tidy. Yeah and I think as well that that does highlight as well the kind of um, uh, pride in 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 the work of the actual people doing it so I know we've had contractors say you know they've had um, guys doing foundations who take self who've been taking selfies of themselves with their found you know amazing <laughs> bit of insulation they've cut to a really complicated shape and they're like who'd ever heard of a you know a kind of um, contractor taking a selfie of them doing their you know they were absolutely amazed and we were like well you know if you give people pride in their work then they will do these things so it's quite interesting yeah hearing all that um, right, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, uh, was Harris Academy an off-site modular construction school? Um, so we did use some, no, it was all built on site. Um, the, we had CLT was the main structure from the first floor up. So we had concrete structure on the ground floor. Um, so yeah, the, the CLT aspects of it were manufactured and prefabricated in KLH's factory and um, so that did mean that a lot of things had to be locked in early on like the MEP kind of all of the service penetrations they had to be defined and locked in quite early on in comparison to I think there was one situation or they were like warning that if a uh, service penetration had to be done had to be drilled on site it would take like a full day to get through that thickness like 300 mil of CLT um, so that aspect was pre, um, prefabricated, but everything else then, so it was interesting on the upper floors where we've got the timber cladding, we went for a kind of Martin truss detail, so we had a lot of timber eye joists that were assembled on site, and um, Wilmot Dixon or their subcontractor, they assembled a kind of ad hoc studio, uh, not studio, but workshop on site where they could manufacture the eye joists um, to kind of assemble that on site, but then they installed it onto the building and um, yeah it was that was all done on site though. Perfect. Um, what were your um, hang on a minute main positive, main positive points and challenging points working with a large main contractor? Um, positive points they were just so well I don't know um, they just seemed really enthusiastic and everything that was being done it was being done to a really good standard like I guess the stakes are higher on a bigger project like that and um, so they really wanted to make sure that it was done properly so if ever there was a problem with um I don't know the airtightness membrane being ripped or you know there being a little puncture in it then they would be you know really cautious to make sure that either that area completely was done again and um, or just making sure that there was yeah that they they you know they didn't pump unnecessary money on it but if there was something that needed to be remediated then they did invest the money to make sure that it wasn't going to fail the the airtightness test so that was really good and I think they could do that because they had 
um, a larger they were a, they were a larger company so they can you know invest in this first flagship passive house project and because they Wilmot Dixon you know they want they wanted to be able to use passive house on other projects then um, they yeah they wanted to you could see that they were invested in it for the long term not just for this project so that was good um, negative things so negative things about the working with a big contractor was it yeah sort of challenging rather than negative challenging um, <laughs> be a bit more positive <laughs> I don't know I guess they, oh, I don't know. They, I guess, uh, That's good. You can't think of any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. Um, yeah, maybe they'd be like more established in the ways that they do things. Um, but they were quite on board. They were really, and um, you know, I was saying that it was design and build. Um, like Archetype were down on site every week and they were really, uh, you know, open to Archetype being on site and visiting. I know that. On some projects it's not been like that on design and build like contractors will keep the architects away or the pacifist designers away as much as possible um but here they yeah they did want to get archetype you do know you get think, their opinion or not so that's do good. you think that was down to anything that you did um or was it just down to the personalities involved at wilmot dixon i wonder yeah like <laughs> there was a good team of them working on it for definite and i think yeah like the personalities at archetype and um, christian and mark and everybody they wanted to be on site a lot as well everyone was feeling quite protective of it to make sure that it was a good thing so i think a lot did come down to personality and it's that point isn't it it comes down to the relationships and um, so it's important and i don't know it is possible i think in the brief to try and like instill that in some way by setting out the responsibility so it doesn't become like a blame game if you set that out in the brief then that helps to that like um, encourage those positive relationships and positive personalities i think yeah. Yes, I think that's very interesting because that's something that we do push quite a lot in the training courses that we do. Um, we, we kind of say, you know, that the, the, the way this passive house works best is that teamwork and collaboration and getting rid of the kind of blame culture that that does sometimes exist in, unfortunately, in our construction industry. So it is interesting that when we have these successful projects, um, trying to yeah tease out why or how how we've managed to get make that work because that's exactly what we're aiming for um, and it obviously is happening on quite a lot of projects so yeah I, I know there's a um, we speak to clients who just don't believe us that contractors can ever be like that but <laughs> <laughs> they can they can <laughs> um, right okay is any um, we're pro probably good to go to um, get Andrew back with us then and if anybody out there has questions they kind of want to put to everybody on the panel um, sort of general questions about Passive House or any of anything from any of the uh, presentations you've seen today. Let's see if we can get Andrew back. Andrew, are you there? It's not answering us. Come for a cup of tea. Oh no, there he is. Okay, right. well done. <laughs> so, um, welcome back. Um, so, we'll just wait and see if we've got some questions from from everyone. This um, everyone out there. Hello. Um, hopefully, you're all still with us. We've got another maybe five minutes if there are any more questions um otherwise i'll have to think of some so come on everyone think of a question anything we'll we go back and revisit some of the ones we've talked about before um one of the ones um actually that there was a question that oh, what was i going to find um it's down the bottom here um that might apply to I don't, experience. We'll see what you both think of it. But do you think that um, this, the sort of quality in the QA, we talked quite a bit about kind of achieving that on site and with the contractors and stuff. So does that make, do you, in, have you found that that makes the program longer because there's more QA than normal or does it is it just that the QA that happens anyway is happening in a different way? Yeah, I think it's really important that there is that it's integrated into the normal process so that it's not going to take ages the, the you know the information that's needed for certification is the information as you go along um, but i do think it's important that the the main contractor highlights to the subcontractors that it's needed and you know that extra care and a bit of extra time is is required um, because if it you know if it all gets left until the last minute then the subcontractor it will take them a long time to go back and take photos of all of the insulation so it's just good if they've got a tape measure and a camera handy as they're going along at the end of every day, just to take like key shots. 
Um, so it, it shouldn't take that much longer, but a lot of the time I think it doesn't get done as you go along and then it takes longer at the end. Um, but yeah, that seemed to work quite well with Wilmot Dixon's, like in order to, for the subcontractor to finish and to get paid, they had to produce their QD sheets anyway. And um, so it was yes. done through that. That's what we found with some contractors. Is they said, actually, it just sort of, um, that their QA, it just goes sort of on top, layer, another layer on their QA procedures or just help them actually to develop their QA procedures they were doing anyway and make them better rather than it being a whole new thing. Um, that's sort of the feedback we'd had as well. Yeah. It is good if they can get Andrew. like filed and folded though, isn't it? It takes a while to get through those videos. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, we've got some questions that come in. Hang on a minute. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, this one's more for, well, hang on. Any, let's just one at the end. Any Passive House Plus schools in the pipeline? I believe you've done one, haven't you? Or you're doing one? Yeah, yeah. so Hackbridge um, Primary School, that's also by the same client, London Borough of Sutton. And um, they, well, it's again completed and we're just waiting for the last bits of information from MEP subcontractors <laughs> to get that one. So that's going to be Passive House Plus once it's certified. And um, so, so yeah, it's all been gone to like the higher level. We've got a lot more renewable energy has been introduced to that one. And um, we've used ground source heat pump and also PVs. So it kind of adds an extra layer of um, complexity in a way, having to depend on the renewable stuff. Ideally, you just want to go at it through the fabric only. But for Passive House Plus, you do need to depend a bit more on renewable technology. And um, so yeah, that's just down the road from this Harris Academy certain. Any plans for Passive House Plus in Edinburgh? I think I would quite like to see a passive house school built and then make that decision. <laughs> yeah, let's go one step uh, at a time. I think you're probably the, right. You know, the, you know, the direction of travel is, is, is in improving standards. So, you know, I, I, I would imagine that that would be the direction of travel. Yeah. And um, going back to the design side of things a bit more again, um, we, I think that was a question we had earlier about it, but looking at thinking about the design and whether it took longer to kind of do because of Passive House, were there more design iterations that you had to go through, do you think, with Passive House? Because you had all the different tools that you were kind of um, comparing against all the different, um, yeah, or, or was it just yes. inter all integrated yeah. together? I, I don't know if, uh, if about the projects, it's done a bit, but the projects we've got that are at various stages, the most advanced at Reba Stage 4, have they taken a bit of time? Yes, they have. Um, I don't know, but we've added in you know, that technical oversight that I talked about in my presentation in to, to it, so we're taking a bit more interest in it. So the technical oversight certainly provides a lot, delays some of that kind of process of gateway review we're trying to mitigate that by by by, by seeing all the the, the the calculations and the you know the, the outputs as you developed rather than wait to like stage three and get a you know everybody's 200 page document and read through that you know but um yeah maybe a, a, a wee bit but not massively but, well, yeah not enough for you to notice that obviously yeah, I, think you'll have a would, head, yeah. I, I would much rather take an extra I was saying, you know, the life of, of the project, while it's on the design board, is, is timely compared to the overall life of the project. I'd much rather take an extra month than, on the design of a building and get it right. Yeah, that's that's really that. interesting in terms of that first slide, you, one of the early slides you had where it was like five to ten years just to decide you need a new building. Yeah. When you put it in that context, you know, like you say, if you take a little bit longer just to get it right, is that a problem? Yeah. That's quite a good, nice okay. way of contextualising that. I think it's only a problem. It's only a problem if you haven't foreseen that, if you haven't allowed that time. Yes. If you allow that time, it's generally not. A, if you allow that additional time, it's not a problem. If you don't allow that time, and then the program gets squeezed, then that then it is a problem. Yeah. Schools are generally like to be finished in July. So. And the, and I think the the. Um, then that always goes back as well to the sort of cost, doesn't it? And the question about cost and is it, does it cost more? And again, it's it's understanding, isn't it? How much, as long as you're aware of how much it's going to cost, you can start 
But the design Very stage well is that, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't, know. I don't want to go there with lots of art. <laughs> <laughs> um, does passive house design lead, lead itself to reduced embodied carbon? The passive house, Andrew, do you want to answer? Sorry. Well, passive house itself I, I, doesn't... Mentioned, I mentioned the net zero carbon public sector building standard that the Scottish Government have uh, released just uh, six weeks ago. And uh, both the, the, the two projects that are further advanced from us are passive house projects at Kerry High School, through the high school, and Maybury Primary School are set against that criteria included embodied carbon. We haven't previously measured embodied carbon, but we did score quite well against the criteria and that new standard. So I can't say how, how is that an improvement because we didn't measure it before, but the, the two schools that we've got scored quite well. Yeah, I guess it is always with flagging up that pacifies itself. It doesn't stipulate anything to do with, like you can use any type of construction method technically. Um, yeah, in body carbon, it's not measured in passive house, but generally the less fabric you have um, and the, the types of construction like using timber, it works a lot better for the thermal continuity. And um, so often you end up with quite um, a higher performance in terms of embodied carbon as well, but it doesn't measure it. And I think you're right, Andrew, that you've got to have something there, a kind of framework there to be able to measure it, to actually know for right, for the, the good that you are, um, yeah, how well you are performing on the embodied as well as operational. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again. Thank you very much once again for um, presenting to us both really interesting presentations. Um, hopefully I'm sharing my screen now. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you both um, for this afternoon and for answering all the questions. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we answered all of them today. So that was great. Um, so just for everyone who's still with us, um, don't forget there's still some more to come. Um, we've got the Oh, setting a passive house budget for all of you who keep asking about the cost. There you go. We can, um, we're going to be discussing that on the next one on the 2nd of June. Um, we've got one on appointing and managing the designers and contractors. And, um, and then last, we've got the early stage design decisions. And then the other one to really flag up is on the Wednesday, the 23rd of June, we've got this client procurement workshop. Um, and you need to book separately for that one. So that one is, um, it's going to be a really a uh, great event because um, well it's a meeting and not a webinar so this one um, it's going to be limited numbers so that we can kind of get um, a lot of engagement and discussion going and there'll be the opportunity to put detailed questions to an expert panel um, and also that one won't be recorded so it's an opportunity to share to talk about sensitive topics um, it's open to local authorities school building clients um, anyone who's interested in these things. So just flagging that one up is that's gonna be a slightly different um, format than the other webinars. So please join us for those if you can. And um, thank you for coming uh, this afternoon.